Okay, here we're going to talk about section 7.6, which is graphs of sine and cosine functions. Now, um, before we get into the nitty gritty of graphing um, and we learn some, some new definition words, um, I wanna take us back to transformations in college algebra because we're going to be using these to graph the functions that they give us and I need you guys to remember, or at least have this to jog back your memory, okay? And so I have two different things of what's happening. I have what it will look like, so where the number will show up, A is representing this any number, um, and then it's telling you what the transformation is, so what that will do to the graph of f of x, and then, what you will do to the points to graph this function versus the original f of x, okay? So, for instance, if you have a factor outside the basic function, so in the front, so it's like a coefficient, right? If you have that there, then the, that means that you're gonna have a vertical stretch of the original function by a factor of whatever that coefficient is. And what do we do? To graph the new function, we multiply the y-coordinates of the old function by that number. And that will give us the coordinates for the new fraction, okay? So when I say old fraction, I mean the original f of x. And when I say new fraction, I mean this thing, okay? Same for this. This would be my new one, my new one, my new one, so on and so forth, okay? f of x being the old one. Now, what happens if the A is inside the function? Now, since we're gonna be talking about sines and cosines, that means that the A, the coefficient, is like where the angle goes, right? It's inside the sine function or inside the cosine function. In that case, you have what's called a horizontal stretch um, by a factor of A. And then what do we do to get the points for the new graph? We divide the X coordinates of the original function by that factor. So if this was a five, then I would take all of my x coordinates of f and divide them by five to get my new coordinates. Now, similarly, if you have a fraction in front of as a coefficient, that means it's going to be a vertical shrink, okay? And then it's going to be a shrink by the factor of a. You still multiply the y coordinates by a. The only difference is, is if it's a whole number, then it stretches it, and if it's a fraction, it shrinks it, right? Um, essentially, if this value is um, greater than one, it'll stretch it, and if this value is smaller than one, then it will shrink it, okay? Um, and then if you have f of x, where you have a denominator inside where your angle is, in sine and cosine, then you're going to do the opposite, which is multiply your x coordinates by um, that value a. Okay, now if you have a negative on the outside, like as a coefficient, then that's going to cause your graph to reflect over the x axis, which means you're going to have to change all the signs of the y coordinates. If you have the negative on the inside, okay, like where your angle is, then the graph is going to reflect over the y coordinate over the y-axis, so you're gonna have to change the signs of all the x-coordinates. Now, all three of these things have to do with multiples, right? A multiple greater than one outside the function, a multiple greater than one inside the function, a multiple less than one outside, a multiple less than one inside, a negative multiple outside, a negative multiple inside. So all of these have to do with multiples. So all of these transformations have to be done first. Now, it doesn't matter if you have a negative um, number on the outside and a positive number on the inside. That means you would have to use this because the negative is on the outside. You would have to use this and you would have to use this. It doesn't matter which order you do them in. As long as you do all three of these, it doesn't matter what order you do them in, okay? What's important though, is that you get these three things done before you start doing your shifting, okay? And so shifting is the, has nothing to do with multiples, it has to do with numbers being added or subtracted, okay? 
And so these will be the last things that you do. And again, it doesn't matter what order you do them. If you have a plus outside the basic function and a minus inside the basic function, you do have to do both of these transformations. Which one you decide to do first and which one you decide to do second is totally up to you. You just have to make sure both of them are done, okay? So remember, you've got your multiple transformations, which can be done in whatever order you need to do them in. Just make sure all of them get done that apply to your problem. After your multiple transformations have been applied, then go in and do your shift transformations. Okay, so the ones that are being added and subtracted. Um, so if you're adding a, a number outside the basic function, so basically you have like sine or cosine of something, and then a plus a number on the outside, or you would have plus or minus inside. So this would be adding or subtracting something within the angle, within the argument of the, tri of the trig function. So like, tangent of theta, or not tangent because this section is sine and cosine, but like sine of theta plus pi, right? You're adding a value in there, so it's going to shift it. And what does it do? If you have a plus on the outside, it shifts it up. And so how do you get the point? You add that value to the y coordinate. If you minus a number on the outside of the basic function, you're going to shift it downward. And so then you're going to subtract that value from all the y coordinates. If I'm adding on the inside of the basic function, so inside the sine or the cosine function, that means it's going to move to the left, which means I'm actually going to subtract a from all the x coordinates. And then if it's minus a on the inside of the basic function, that means everything's going to shift to the right, and I need to add that value to all the x coordinates. So I have this here. I mean, you can um, go back into the recording and write this all down if you got to pause it, but this is going to be very, very, very helpful when it comes to graphing these things. And to be honest, when I was taking pre-calculus, I felt like graphing the trigonomic functions was the hardest concept out of everything. Um, I particularly am pretty, um, I, I like algebra because you get to play around and you get to manipulate and, and, and add things and subtract things and multiply things and divide things and factor and all this other cool stuff that, that I find fun. Um, so those kinds of things um, and using all of the trig formulas, that stuff is fun to me. Um, but when it came to graphing these guys, that was really the hardest part for me. So I'm trying my best to break it down so that it makes sense to everyone and so that it's not as difficult for you as it was for me when I was taking pre-cal. Um, that really is my goal when I teach calculus and pre-cal, cal 2, is to break down the concepts that were super hard for me um, taking the classes so that everyone can understand them as a student. Um, I unfortunately didn't have the type of teacher that would break everything down so they left a lot for us to guess and wonder. Um, and I had to do a lot of research and a lot of homework problems to figure out what was really going on um, to make sense of everything. So let's see. It says to graph a function quickly, a graphing calculator can be used to enter the function and then observe the graph on a rectangular coordinate system. Because sine and cosine both represent functions, the same can be done when graphing y equal to f of x equals sine x and y equal to f of x equals cosine x. Here the independent variable is x, an angle measured in degrees or radians, and y, the dependent variable, represents the y coordinate on the unit circle. Now, um, it says graph the functions in the form of a times sine of something times x using transformations. Complete the following table along with plotting the points and creating the graph of y equal to sine x. In addition, as you're working, ask yourself why a table going from 0 to 2 pi was picked. Why is it enough to get an idea of what the graph of y equals sine of x looks like. 
Those are very good questions. Why do we pick from zero to two pi? We just um, talked about in 7.5 that sine and cosine have what's called a period um, of two pi, which means after two pi, everything's just going to start repeating itself all over again. Okay. So we don't need to keep going beyond zero and two pi since we already know that everything's just going to be a repeat of what we had before. So um, let's go ahead and start finding these values. Now, if you remember these values, fantastic, all the better power to us, right? But if we don't remember these values, um, then we can use our calculator. And these all seem to be in radian mode, so they've chosen to use radian mode. Um, sine of pi over 2 is going to be 1. So the point is going to be pi over 2 and 1. And then sine of 5 pi over 6 is 1 half. And so then we get 5 pi over 6 and 1 half. And then sine of pi, I believe is 0. Yep. So we get pi and 0. Sine of 7 pi over 6 is negative 1 half. So 7 pi over 6 and negative 1 half. And then sine of 3 pi over 2. Oops, wrong button. Oops, wrong button again. There we go. Negative 1. Uh, sine of 11 pi over 6 is negative 1 half. And then sine of 2 pi is going to be 0. So let's draw this, right? So we have the point 0, 0. So that's this point here. And then we have the point pi over 6. So that means I need to cut up 1 half into thirds to get pi over 6. So pi over 6 and 1 half is here, because this is 1. Then pi over 2 and 1. Then 5 pi over 6, so cut that in 6 is a, into thirds again. I'm doing the best, but no, it's not exactly thirds. Um, but pi over 2 is the same as um, 3 pi over 6. So that's 1 pi over 6, 2 pi over 6, 3 pi over 6, 4 pi over 6, 5 pi over 6. And we get the value 1 half again. Then pi and the y value is 0. 7 pi over 6 is going to be, this is 6 pi over 6, right? So 7 pi over 6 is here. And negative 1 half is about there. This is about a half. That's about a negative half. And then 3 pi and negative 1. And then um, 11 pi over 6. So that would be here and negative one half, and then two pi and zero again. And so if I connect my dots as best as I can, this is what we come up with. Okay, and so that is one period of sine. Now, if you want to draw the entire graph of sine, normally what we do is we draw one period and then we just extend this and put an arrow because it's just going to repeat again. And then we draw this, extend that, and put an arrow because it's just going to do the same thing on the other side and repeat. It's a sine wave, right? I know people have heard of that. And it's because the function just goes up and down and up and down in that same periodic um, direction. Okay. So remember from before, this is just another little summary box, but you are going to have a couple of questions in the homework that ask you about this little summary box. So we know that the domain is all real numbers, right? This is going forever to the left and forever to the right. So the domain is all real numbers. We know that the range is from negative one, the lowest point, to positive one, the highest point. 
and they are inclusive because we do have solid dots on the graph there. And then the sine function is odd. It is symmetric with respect to the origin, which means if I take it and I reflect it over the x-axis and then I reflect it over the y-axis, it lands on itself pretty much. Um, the x-intercepts are integer multiples of pi. So 0, pi, 2 pi, it would intersect at 3 pi, 4 pi, negative pi. It intersects at all integer multiples of pi. The y-intercept is 0 here, right? That's the y-intercept. And then the maximum value is 1. The highest y-value is 1. And it occurs at these values. So odd integers of pi. Um, and it's actually every other odd integer of pi, starting with pi over 2. And then the minimum value is negative 1, and it occurs at the other odd integers of pi, um, the ones that you didn't skip. So basically, you have positive 1, then 0, then negative 1, then 0, then positive 1, then 0, then negative 1, then 0, and all of those multiples. Okay. So let's see what they want us to do with this information. So we've got the problem here. Let me scoot this down. It says graph y equals negative 2 sine of x plus pi over 4 by first describing the following. A, what is the basic function we are graphing? That's sine, right, or sine of x. And then it says, what are the three transformations involved and how does each affect the basic function? So we obviously see we have a negative coefficient there that's going to reflect the graph over the x-axis. We have a two coefficient, which is going to stretch the graph by a factor of two vertically. And then we have this plus pi over four inside the angle, um, which is going to shift the graph to the left. And again, I am using all of those transformations that I had here. So negative reflects over x axes. Um, a number that's bigger than one is going to vertically stretch, right? And then adding pi over 4 inside, so adding pi over 4 inside is going to shift it to the left pi over 4 unit. Okay? And so I have the description of what I'm going to do to get those values. So, I'm first going to start off with these values for sine, and I chose these values because these are the values that I mentioned in the previous page where I'm going to get zero, and then I'm going to get one, get zero, and then negative one, and then zero again, right? So we basically have all the peaks and valleys, and then we have all of the x-intercepts in one period. So I specifically chose those points for a purpose. So now what we've got to do is we've got to reflect, right? We've got to take care of this situation here first. We have to do both of these two before we can do those. So these got to be done first, and then you can do this one last, okay? So it doesn't matter what order, I'm just going down the list, right? Um, so our first thing to do is the reflection. So to do that, I have to change my y coordinates to the opposite sign. So the x coordinates are not going to change. Those are going to stay exactly the same. And then 0, if I change the sign, a neutral guy is still neutral. Positive 1 will turn into negative 1. 0 will stay 0. Negative 1 will turn into positive 1. 0 will stay 0. Now the vertical stretch. Now I've got to take all my y coordinates and multiply them by 2. So again, my x values are not changing. It didn't mention to do anything to my x coordinates, so those are going to remain the same. And now I'm going to multiply my y coordinates by 2. 0 times 2 is still 0. Negative 1 times 2 is negative 2. 0, 1 times 2 is 2, and then again 0. Finally, I'm going to shift the graph. So I have to take my old x coordinate and subtract pi over 4. So 0 subtract pi over 4 is negative pi over 4. Pi over 2 subtract pi over 4, I believe is pi over 4, but I always double check just to make sure. Yes, pi over 4. Pi minus pi over 4 should be 3 pi over 4. Oops. Yep, 3 pi over 4. 
and then three pi over two minus pi over four is five pi over four and then two pi minus pi over four is seven pi over four so and the y values i'm not doing anything to them here so negative two zero two zero so i am i have fourths so i am going to have to cut the halves in half to get the fourths right so there's um, negative pi over 4 and 0 means I'm right on top of the x-axis. Um, positive pi over 4 and negative 2 means I'm down here. 1, 2, 3 pi over 4. 4 pi over 4. 5 pi over 4. 6 pi over 4. 7 pi over 4. Just so I know where they are on the x-axis. Um, and then I'm going to plot my point. So I've already done negative pi over 4 and 0. I've already done positive pi over 4 and negative 2. Now I'm going to do 3 pi over 4 and 0, 5 pi over 4 and positive 2, and then 7 pi over 4 and 0 again. And so if I connect my dots, I know it's going to make that, um, wave graph but there's one period right and if i extend this and draw an arrow and i wish i drew better not so messy but extend that one and put an arrow there and you've got the sine function right so you only have one period if you don't put the arrows once you put the arrows you draw the entire graph right um but that's what that graph will look like. So I am definitely using all of those transformation information that I showed you on that page. So now we're going to move on to cosine. So let's just graph the original cosine. And then essentially, I'm going to take these same x coordinates, but the y coordinates will definitely be different because I'll be talking about a different function. So um, <clears throat> cosine now of pi over 2. is zero cosine of two pi over three is negative one half cosine of pi is negative one cosine of four pi over three is negative one half cosine of three pi over two is zero cosine of five pi oops five pi over three which is positive one half and then cosine of two pi which is one and so my coordinates are pi over two and zero two pi over three and negative one half and pi and negative one four pi over three and negative one half um three pi over two and zero and five pi over three and one half and then 2 pi and 1. So they don't have thirds, so I'm going to have to throw in thirds. So the only way to do that is to get the sixes, or you can just do, nah, do the sixes. So 1, 2, 3, 4. Okay, so this is pi over 6, 2 pi over 6, which is pi thirds, 3 pi over 6, 4 pi over 6, which is 2 pi over 3, 5 pi over 6, 6 pi over 6, 7 pi over 6, 8 pi over 6, which is 4 pi over 3, 9 pi over 6, 10 pi over 6, which is 5 pi over 3, 11 pi over 6, and then 12 pi over 6. Okay, so now let's plot our points. First, we have 0, 0. Then we have um, pi over three and one half positive, pi over two and zero, two pi over three and negative one half, pi and negative one, 
4 pi over 3 and negative 1 half, 3 pi over 2 and 0, 5 pi over 3 and positive 1 half, and then I finally get back to, um, oh, this should be 0, why? No, 2 pi and I get 1, gotcha. I think this is wrong. I don't know why that's there. Cosine of zero is one, not zero. So this one was wrong. I thought it was me for a second, but it was, these notes were wrong. So this should have been zero and one. So then if I trace this, I get this graph here. I'm trying to make it connect nice and beautifully, but you know me, I can never make it look just right, but it's okay, you get the idea. No, it looks like this, okay? And so this one is um, the cosine. And so this is one cycle of cosine. We start at one, we get back to one, the whole thing's gonna repeat itself all over again. So you just come back down here and draw an arrow, go back down that way and draw an arrow, and now you have the entire cosine wave with the arrows. Now, here are some properties of the cosine. Okay, so you will have a problem over the properties. Now, it says the domain is the set of all real numbers. The range is from negative one to one in those points. Um, the cosine is an even function, which means it is symmetric with respect to the y-axis. So if here's the y-axis. If I would have continued drawing the curve, you'll notice that what's on the right side of the curve is a mirror image of what's on the left side of the curve. Um, the cosine function, it does have a period with a period of two pi. X-intercepts are on odd multiples of pi, and the y-intercept is one. Then the maximum value is one, which occurs at multiples of two pi, and the minimum value of negative one occurs at multiples of uh, odd pi, odd multiples of pi. So now it wants me to graph this function. So cosine of two x minus three, by first describing the following. So what is the basic function? right, or you could say cosine of x. So the basic one is cosine of x. Um, and then what are the two transformations involved and how does each affect the basic graph? Well, here you have a two inside with the angle, which means that's going to stretch it horizontally by a factor of two. And then you have a minus three on the outside of the function, which means it's going to shift the graph of cosine down three units, okay? So those are our two transformations. Now remember, we have to do the multiples first and then we can do the add and subtract stuff second, okay? So first I need to get the values for cosine. So cosine of zero is one, cosine of pi over two is zero, cosine of pi is negative one, cosine is zero, and then positive one. And so to horizontally stretch this, I'm going to have to take my x coordinates and I'm going to have to divide them by two. So we're gonna take zero divided by two is zero. Pi halves over two divided by two is pi over four. Pi divided by two is pi over two. Three pi over two divided by two is three pi over four. And two pi divided by two is Okay, now doesn't say how to do anything to the y values, so I'm gonna keep all of my y values exactly the same as they were before. Then the next thing says I've gotta shift it down. How do you do that? You take your y values and then now you subtract three. So I'm gonna take one minus three is negative two, zero minus three is negative three, negative one minus three is negative four, zero minus three is negative three, one minus three is negative two. 
I'm not doing anything to my X values, so they're going to stay the same from the previous. And those were the only two transformations we had to do, so we're going to go ahead and um, figure this problem out. So let's plot these points. So 0 and negative 2. And it does have pi over 4. So this is pi over 4, 2 pi over 4, 3 pi over 4, and then 4 pi over 4 is 5. So pi over 4 and negative 3, um, pi over 2 and negative 4, 3 pi over 4 and negative 3, pi and negative 2. And so then you've got that. Um, periodic motion going there, that cosine wave. I'm trying my best to draw. <laughs> um, and then we know that this is going to come downward and keep doing the wave thing. This is going to come downward and keep doing the wave thing. So as long as we put those angles on there, um, we should have that down. Okay, so that is the graph. But we're definitely using those transformations, which is why I wanted to have that review at the beginning and talk about what we're doing to get the coordinates for the new graph. That really does help a lot. It helped me a lot. Um, I don't think my teachers explained to me where these points were coming from. They were just like, uh, stretch it and then uh, reflect it and then um, shift it and here's a new dot. <laughs> and they didn't really explain where those dots were coming from, but they did come from the transformation. So uh, here we have another problem that's going to be kind of similar to this. They're going to give us a function and then they're going to ask us to compare them. So um, as defined in many dictionaries, I cannot say this word, sinusoidal, sinus, I don't know how to say that word, but this word here, these kinds of functions are of relating to shape like or varying according to a sine curve. This means that you that any curve that is a transformation of the sine curve is called this type of function. Okay. Graph the cosine function in the space below. Then shift the graph of the curve to the right pi over two units. Okay. What do you find? So I am going to graph, or I would look at the points for sine, for cosine. The y values would be 1, 0, negative 1, 0, and 1. Now, if I shift that to the right, pi over 2 units, it means I would have to do minus pi over 2 in the parentheses, right? So these things match. But what am I doing to the graph? I'm actually going to be adding pi over 2 to the x values. That's what shifting to the right does, is it adds pi over 2 to the x values. So 0 becomes pi over 2. Pi over 2 becomes pi. Pi becomes 3 pi over 2. 3 pi over 2 becomes 2 pi. And then 2 pi plus pi over 2 becomes 13 pi over 2. Okay. Now, the y values are going to stay all the same. And then let's go look at what happens if we take the sine. Okay, so this is the sine function, completely different function. So sine of negative pi over 2. Is negative 1. Sine of 0, we know is 0. Sine of pi over 2 is 1. Sine of pi is 0. Sine of 3 pi over 2 is negative 1. And then sine of 2 pi is 0. And then just because I have this extra guy there, I'm going to put 13 pi over 2. Sine of 13 pi over 2 is 1. And so if you notice, notice that this, these points start at pi over 2. So if I chop that off and I just look at these coordinates, they are exactly the same coordinates. So what does that tell me? That tells me 
that shifting the cosine pi over two to the right will look the exact same as sine looks, okay? And you can draw them if you want. Um, and I'm gonna draw both the original cosine. So cosine, original cosine is this. Right, that's what cosine looked like when we drew it before. Again, I am horrible at drawing this, but you get the idea. Okay, and then if I shift it over pi over two, That means you end up with, oops, that went too far down. I was only supposed to go to one. I went too far low. So here we go, that's one, negative one, there we go. So that's what cosine was supposed to look like. And then if I shift all these points over, pi over two units, you'll notice that now you have this function. And that was the sine wave. Right, if I keep going, I'll come up here and then keep going that way. So they are the same graph, just one shifted over, okay? The, the original one is there, and then this red one is when it shifted, and that red one is also the graph of sine, okay? And so that's all they're saying is that there's semi pseudo, I don't know how you say that word, but they're that those kinds of graphs, sine and cosine are both um, basically graphs of signs shifted. So it says, next idea says, determine the amplitude and period of these semi-pseudo um, functions. Because the sine and cosine functions are transformations of each other, the sine and cosine functions are called that word, why do they keep torturing me with that word? I'm gonna type how to pronounce semi-pseudo. Okay, let's listen. Oh, it's not doing it for me. Hmm, I wonder why my function doesn't want to do it for me. Sinusoidal. Sinusoidal, that's what it says. Sinusoidal. Sinusoidal. I've always said sinusoidal, but it's sinusoidal. Okay, so it says, let's explore some generalities about these functions. Um, complete the table below by looking at the graph of the following functions. So we're gonna be looking at cosine, two cosine, and one half cosine. Now, what happens to the range when you do this? Remember, you end up multiplying the y values by this, which affects the range. So then your range that usually was supposed to be from negative one to one will now get multiplied by two. So your ranges will be now from negative two to two. Here your range, your y values will get multiplied by one half, meaning your range will now become negative one half to one half. So the values of the functions, y equals a sine x and y equals a cosine x, where a is not zero, always satisfy the inequalities where the y values will be between the negative of that a and the positive of that a. Because it dictates the height of the graph. In terms of transformations, it determines the vertical stretch slash compression, okay? <clears throat> so that number, that coefficient, is going to determine um, how high and how low your graph goes. 
that's really important because when in the homework assignments, you're going to be given a bunch of pictures and they basically want you to look at that and tell them what the function is. And it's the amplitude is one of the easiest ways to outrule a bunch of options because depending on how high and how low that goes, um, that's going to tell you your amplitude right away. And you can probably knock off probably two thirds of the, of the options. Okay. So for number two, it says complete the table below by looking at the graph of the following functions, cosine, cosine of 3x, and cosine of 1 fourth x. Here the period would be pi over 2, but since you're going to have to get those x values and here divide them by 3, you're, it's going to uh, compress it. So then that means that you're going to actually end up with a period of 2 pi over 3. If you have to do one over four, so you're going to take that same period and then now you're going to divide it by one pi over four or the same thing as multiplying, right? Two pi times four, because we do the opposite. Um, so you get that eight pi. I only put it as division because I wanted you to notice something. Multiplying by four is the exact same thing as dividing by one fourth, okay? our fraction ideas, right? So I did it like that on purpose because it wants us to generalize it. And we notice that if we have a number in front of our variable inside those sine and cosine functions, um, that's omega. If omega is positive, then our period ends up becoming two pi divided by that omega value. And then that just from that represents how long it's going to take to draw one cycle of the graph, so one whole period of the graph. Remember, for sine, the period looks like this. And then for cosine, it looks like this. So you have to make sure you get that entire um, image. Actually, sine looks like this. Right, it goes start at zero and you get to zero. Here you start at one and you keep going till you get to one again. So this is for sine and this is for cosine. That's what one entire cycle looks like. Now, of course I didn't draw it correctly because you could tell this is wider than this, but you get the idea. Now, if your omega is greater than zero, then the amplitude um, and the period of these functions are A is, Amplitude is the absolute value of that coefficient, and the period is the absolute value, or the period is 2 pi over whatever that omega is. They use the letter T to describe the period from now on. I'm not sure why they don't use P. I'm guessing like later they're going to use P for something else, but they don't use P for period. They use the letter capital T. So capital T represents the period. I usually don't write capital T, I usually just write the word period. Um, so it says here, determine the amplitude and the period of these functions. So we know that the amplitude is going to be the absolute value of four, which is just four. Because remember, the negative just tells me that the graph's going to flip over. That doesn't change the fact that the graphs are going up to four and negative four, right? So then here, the amplitude is going to be the absolute value of one half, which is just one half. Here, the period is going to be um, 2 pi over omega, which is 3 in this case, so just 2 pi over 3. And the period here is going to be 2 pi over negative pi, which reduces to just negative 2. So it's negative 2 radians. Um, oh, and it says with omega being greater than 0. So don't use a negative for omega just use the positive. The negative just means it's going to reflect over the y-axis, but that's not going to affect the period. So the period should just be two. So it's going to take two radian units to graph one full period of this sine function. So it says, in addition to graphing the sinus pseudo functions using transformations, we can use the periodic nature of these functions to graph using key points. Consider the following graphs. Now, I kind of already mentioned this, right? These are the values that I've been using. 
when I was doing the charts. So for sine and for cosine both, I've always used zero, pi over two, pi, three pi over two, and two pi. Get in the habit of getting those points. Those are gonna be your key points because those points, no matter which graph you're looking at, are gonna tell you your peaks, your valleys, and your x-intercepts, okay, of one period, right? They're not exactly the same, right? At zero, I have an x-intercept. I mean, I have a, yeah, I have an x-intercept up here, I have a peak. For pi over two, I have a peak. For pi over two, I have an x-intercept. For pi, I have a x-intercept. For pi, I have a valley, right? So they're not exactly the same, but this behavior of x-intercepts and peaks and valleys is happening at those exact same values. And that has to do with that shifting, right? That they're only different from one another by a shift, okay? So it says, if you take this period here and you take a look at those five key points on each graph, um, you'll notice that what it does is it breaks the um, x-axis up into five subintervals. I'm sorry, four subintervals with five key points. I'm trying to draw this correctly, but it's getting a little bit difficult here. So you've got one interval here, you've got another interval there, a third interval here, and then a fourth interval there, right? You've broken the graph up into four intervals. And those four intervals, if you count the endpoints as well, um, they create those five key points, okay? So again, I've been doing it like this in the chart. There's nothing different, okay? The only thing that happens here is that when uh, you start putting numbers in there, it starts to affect that period okay it starts to affect the values that you need to get that one full cycle okay and so how do we figure out what the sub intervals should look like what they need to be well to find the width you're going to take that period and divide it by four right and that will give you your sub intervals and remember we find a period by taking um, two pi over your omega and then that will then get divided by four okay and that will give you the width of your sub intervals okay so it doesn't give you everything it just gives you the width of them okay so let's let's figure this out so i'm going to take um for this problem I wants to know my amplitude which is the absolute value of four or just four the period, I need to do 2 pi over omega. So in this case, I need to do 2 pi over 2, because omega is 2, which means my period is now pi, okay? Now, if I want to know the width of the subintervals, okay? So the width of the subintervals is going to be that value pi over 4, which means this is the width of my subintervals. So I'm going to start at zero, right? And then I'm going to add a pi over four. I'm going to add a second pi over four. So I get two pi over four. This is the pi over two. Then another pi over four, which gives me three pi over four. Another pi over four, which gives me four pi over four, or just pi. So then my subintervals are going to be from zero to pi over four from pi over four to, what did I say, pi over two, oops, and then pi over two to three pi over four, and then finally from three pi over four to pi. And then the five key points, well, that depends on what the y values are, right? Um, what will those y values be at these numbers? So I am in radian mode, so I'm going to say four sine of two times zero. And I get zero. I'm gonna go back there, and then I'm just gonna type in pi over four. Oops, nope, that was not it. Four sine of two times pi over four, and then close it. There we go, I get four. Go back here. I'm going to get two, zero, Go back there. I'm going to hit mm, three pi over four. 
negative 4, and then go back and delete all of that. And just do times pi. And I get 0. And so then the five key points are going to be 0, 0, pi over 4, and 4, pi over 2, and 0, 3 pi over 4, and negative 4, and then pi and 0. And so you don't have to do all those transformations, okay? As long as you're getting your amplitude and your period and your subintervals, and then you're using your calculators to evaluate the y values. You can just get um, the whole period just like that. So you, really, you just need to work on figuring out what x values to plug in, and this is telling you how to figure that out, okay? And so then if I draw this, I know I'm horrible. One, two, three, four. So this is pi, this is pi over two, pi over four, and three pi over four. One, two, three, four, one, two, three, four. I know I'm not using graphing paper, so it's going to look a little wonky, but it's okay. I can tell just because this line is not even straight. So zero, zero, pi over four and four, pi over two and zero, three pi over four and negative four, and then pi and zero. And does it look like one whole um, cycle of pi? It does. So we we'll just extend and extend, and we have the entire graph of y equals 4 sine of 2x. And so we have a couple of examples kind of like that, where they're going to ask you for these bits of information. So let's try to do another one, right? So we're going to take the amplitude, which is the absolute value of negative 5, which is 5. We're going to do the period, which is 2 pi over omega. So in that case, that is 2 pi over, don't take the sign, just pi over 2, right? So we get um, the pi, so cancel, this actually is 2 pi times 2 over pi. So those cancel and I get 2. So the period is just 2 radians. Now, if I want to figure out what the subintervals are, I'm going to start off at zero, right? But I need to take two, so the subintervals, the width of the subintervals is going to be the t over four, which is two over four or one half unit. So that means this x value is going to be one half. Then from one half plus a half is one. And then one plus a half is three halves. And then three halves plus a half will be four halves, which is two. And so those are our four sub intervals. And then the key points, now I know what x values to plug in. We can just calculate those y values. So let's see. Um, let's clear that out. Negative 5 cosine of negative pi over 2. Oh, I have a double, a double parentheses. Um, times 0. Close it. We get negative 5. Now go back and let me change this to 1 over 2. Oh, nope, it did the wrong thing. 5 cosine of negative pi over 2 times 1 over 2, close my parentheses. Um, that is not a nice number. I'm going to put the exact value in here, but then I'm going to put the um, decimal underneath because I don't know where that is unless I have kind of a guess on where it should look. Then now we're going to plug in 1. So I'm going to delete that times 1, and I get 0. And then I'm going to go back to the fraction 1 and plug in a 3 for the 3 halves. I get 5 squared of 2 over 2. I already know that that's 1.5, and that is 
3.5, about 3.5, right? And then I'm going to go back up and I'm going to plug in 2 and I get 5. So then let's graph this thing. So I only need to use 1 half, 1, 3 halves, and then 2. I need to go 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. So 0 and negative 5, 1 half and negative 3.5, so about right there. 1 and 0, 3 halves and positive 3.5, so about right there. And then 2 and 5, so about right here. So then it gives me this measurement here. Now that's not one full cycle, is it? That's a little interesting. I see what happened here. So I did make a mistake here. Um, this, I mean, it's not a bad thing to make mistakes because everybody does, right? But I realized that I have an error here, right? The pi's canceled, but then I should have had two times two. So you may have caught me a long time ago and then you're just sitting there cringing the whole time. I'm going and going and going, right? <laughs> so here, we actually should have had um, four divided by four, which means that the period should have actually been four. And then I should have four divided by four means my subintervals are going to be one unit. So I would go zero to one and then add one more. You get from one to two, then from two to three, and then from three to four, making that complete period, right? So then these points are wrong. I'm going to leave my um, going to leave my graph there, and I'm going to leave my y values alone because I do know because of the amplitude my y values should be there. But I now know that these values are not correct, and so I'm going to get uh, one, two, three, and four. And now these shouldn't be coming out so funny because remember, we were only supposed to be getting the peaks, the values, and the x intercept. So I should have known better that this was not right, but I definitely could tell at the end because I didn't have a full cycle of a cosine function. We know that a full cycle is supposed to look like that, right? And I didn't have that happening, or it could be upside down and you could have this, okay? So let's see what we get now. When I plug in zero, we got negative five. When we plug in one, we will get negative five cosine of, oh, let me just plug it in there. Oh, watch out. Let me plug in one. I got zero. Then let me plug in two. Oh, I already did, I got five. Then let me plug in three we get zero, and then let me plug in four. And we get negative five. Okay, so now let's see what this looks like. So zero and negative five, one and zero, two and positive five, three and zero, and four and negative five. So then we end up with this and this does look like the correct graph and we know that it's supposed to reflect over the x-axis so that's why it looks like it's upside down than the normal one um, and now we have the full cycle of a cosine function 
So you can tell, right? I mean, there's a couple of places in there where we should have been able to tell what was going on. And um, I missed most of them. It wasn't until I had finished graphing it that I realized, nope, that's not right. Something went wrong. And then I just went back and backtracked. I verified that my amplitude was okay. I went ahead and looked at my computations over here for my period. And that was when I caught my mistake right there. I had forgot all about that little tiny two there. This two times that two meant I should have had four for my period, which means when I did my period divided by four for the four sub intervals, um, I should have had one as my um, sub interval width, okay? Which changed all my intervals, so it changed all my inputs for my key points. And then I ended up with the actual x-intercepts and the peaks and the valleys that I needed. Okay, so here we are with the steps for graphing a sinusoidal function, whether it be sine or cosine, it doesn't matter. So the first thing is determine the amplitude in the period, then divide the interval, um, the full interval from zero to the period into four subintervals, and then use the endpoints of the subintervals to find the key points. Plot the key plot the key points and draw the graph, okay? So it says on both example four and example five, if plus two were added on the end of the function, how would this alter the graph? And I've already written down all the transformations and we already discussed those. We know that if a plus two is on the outside, that um, it would shift the graph up two units and then you would have to add two to all of those y values. So basically all these key points would have one more step where I would have to shift it up. So I would have to add two to this, add two to this, add two, add two, add two, and then the whole graph is gonna go up two units. So here we have our last problem in this section. It does ask me to um, find an equation for the graph. And so you can choose sine or cosine. I base it on where the y-intercept is. If the y-intercept, if the y-intercept is at zero, then that means I'm going to use the sine function. If the y-intercept is at some a value, is not at zero, then I use the cosine function because we already know that the cosine function will start at that amplitude, okay? So here's my y-axis. Let me put it in red. Here's my y-axis, right? And here's the x-axis. And you notice that it has a y-intercept here of negative three. That means, not zero, so that means I'm going to be using this function. Not only that, but no matter what this is, if this value were at positive three, then I would know that A is positive three. If this value is at negative three, then I know that A is negative three. So just knowing that uh, where the y-intercept is, is going to tell you two things, whether you use sine or cosine, and then it's also going to tell you what that um, amplitude is for cosine. If it's not a cosine function, then it was a sine function, then the y-intercept is not going to tell you what the amplitude is. You'll have to look at where the, uh, the peaks are or the values are to figure out that y-intercept. Okay. Now what I have to figure out is I gotta go backwards, okay? So I noticed that it's here and the whole cosine interval, the cycle ends here at the value eight. So I know that one cycle or one period is eight, okay? And we know that the period is equal to two pi over omega. So I know that that is equal to eight. This is gonna help me to figure out what omega is. So I'm gonna multiply both sides by omega which means it'll cancel from here, and I'll now have an omega over there. And then I'm gonna divide both sides by eight, and I get, if I reduce that, I get pi over four equals omega. 
So that means that my function is y equals negative three cosine of pi over four omega. So look for your amplitude and look for your period and then calculate to figure out what the omega is gonna be. Oops, that should be x not omega. Omega is pi over four. I need the variable x. There we go. Now, if it were a sine function, let's say, okay, I know this is not it, but let's just pretend, I know that the red is the axis on this problem, but let's pretend, let's pretend this was the y-axis, okay? Let's pretend. Now, if that were the y-axis, then I would have had a um, y-intercept of zero which means I would have used a sine of omega x, okay? And then I would have checked to see, and just FYI, if that was the case, I would have needed this extra piece over here, which would have been at 10, okay? And then this would have been, this is two, right? So what is the period? From here to where the entire period ends, how many units is that? That's uh, two, four, six, eight units still, okay? So my period would have been eight units. So T was eight, which I know is two pi over omega, and I've already solved this equation and we found out that omega was pi over four. So that means so far, I would know that the graph was pi over four X. The only thing I'm missing is the A. Now I do know that it goes all the way up to three and all the way down to three. So I know that there should be a three there. The only thing I don't know is whether it should be a positive three or a negative three. And that you cannot tell just by um, looking at the y-intercept like you could on this other one, okay? Um, so this one's a little bit different. You have to remember what happens in the regular sine wave. When I graph the regular sine wave, does it go up from the x-intercept or does it go down from the x-intercept? If you look at a regular sine wave, starting at the x-intercept, it naturally goes up, right? Whereas if you look at the um, cosine function, it goes down, right? It starts up at positive and it goes down. Whereas this cosine started at negative and went up. So that's why it had to have that negative in the front. Here, it's behaving exactly as it should, so I don't need to put a negative over on it to flip it over. So this could have been um, the answer, and this could have been the answer. Both of these, um, well, this is not the answer to the pro this problem because I, I changed the problem, right? I put a blue, I put the axis in here, and I completely changed it. So I don't want to box that. That's not part of the answer for this problem. This is the answer if this blue line were my axis, okay? So I just want to, to make you aware how to figure out the sign, okay? Because yes, for the cosine, wherever the y-intercept is, that's going to tell you the a, positive or negative. If it's down here, it's a negative a. If it's up there, it's a positive a. It's the sign that you have to think about, okay? If the curve is going like this, then A is going to be positive. But if the curve is going downward and then up, then the A is going to be negative. So that's basically what you're looking for to figure out the A value, the sine of A value on the sine function. But other than that, that is the end of this section. You're gonna use that amplitude, use that period to figure out all the graphs. Um, and it's, I think there's a big one with a bunch of multiple choices in the homework. So definitely, definitely practice that. And you can see there's quite a few problems that have um, the graphs involved. But that's it. We will talk about 1.7 the next video.